at the College of Science. Uh, I'm Matt Jones, I'm the Head of Science. Um, and this is the very first Founding the Foundry lecture. Now some of you won't know perhaps what the computational foundry is, so I thought I'd just say a few words about it before we start. So these are the things you have to remember about the computational foundry. Right? If you've got your notebooks, you might want to write these down. It's really important. Number one, it's a people. Number two, it's a place. And number three, it has a vital purpose for today and the future. So the people are, well, many of you are part of that community, but we're growing in numbers, both in terms of our faculty of world-class researchers, then the large numbers of student partners that are joining us in this environment. The place, is the Bay Campus, and those of you who've been down and site visits, and those of you who've been along the campus will have seen the beginnings of a marvellous new building, which will have state-of-the-art facilities to house all of activity. But actually, you know, if we fixate on that building and on the scaffolding and all the facilities, we're losing a plot. Because the most important thing to remember about the computational foundry is its purpose. And that is to remind people about the power of deep thinking around computational science, digital innovations, and how we live out our world with these new materials that some of you in this room are helping to create. It's such a big thing for us, and it's things we've been waiting for for a long time, that we thought before we get to the building, we have a number of activities to help us intellectually found the foundry. So it would be a disaster if we turn up in August next year when it opens, and we simply walk through those doors and think, well done us, a lovely new building. It's a critical moment, I think, for all of us to think again about the deep intellectual, scientific challenges and ideas, which are not just for computer scientists, not just for mathematicians, but for a wide set of disciplines where we think of digital. As part of that, we've got this series of lectures, and I'm really delighted to welcome back to the university Professor Richard Harper, who's going to give us the very first lecture. Richard's really the ideal person for lots of things, but particularly for this beginning. Richard started um, his career as an academic, uh, as a sociologist, uh, but then spent a large part of the last is it 20 years in the corporate world, in industrial research, in places like <coughs> Xerox, Park, Europe, and most recently, for a long time, leading a group in Microsoft Research in the UK. A group that really, really shaped social and digital thinking for a decade. Richard's now back um, inside the university in two ways. Most importantly, he's a visiting professor here with us in the College of Science, and also uh, is a professor in uh, the Institute of the Future uh, in uh, Lancaster University. So whether you join me now in welcoming back home, uh, Richard Hopper. Welcome to <laughs> Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I need to put this on. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in such a gloriously old uh, lecture theatre. And uh, I hope the foundry have some lecture theatres which have this rotund um, or shape. Um, I found this on the floor when I was setting up. It says computer foundry, and I wonder what was going to be in it. Um, um, so what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about search. And the reason why I'm going to talk about search and explore issues to do with search has to do with um, the problem of excitement, the problem of imagination, the problem of what you're going to do in the computer foundry, what you're going to do in computer science. Haven't all the big ideas been solved? In the case of HCI, um, some people would say that many of the technologies that we have on our desktop and our mobiles show demonstration that the HCI research has been done. There's an absent face here, a very famous curmudgeon of HCI wrote um, a book, and one of his main books argues that HCI naturally puts itself out of business. 
Come on, guys. Someone should, someone, someone should have known who I'm talking about. Who argues this? You can't answer this question. Well, what lack of erudition. Harold Thimbleby's main claim to fame is the argument that HCI is a business that does itself out of business. He argues that if you do good design, once a good design is done, you should bugger off. You should clear off. You should go away and growl in your office, as he's probably learned to do. So I'm going to ask the question not whether Harold is wrong or right. I think Harold is right in some senses, but that doesn't mean that other things might not be interesting to do, even on something which seems sorted and well thought through in terms of the user experience as search. So how do you approach the problem? You don't ask, what is search? What do I mean by that? You don't ask what the technology is, that's what I mean. You don't ask what the search engine is. You ask what the human is in HCI. Now, this is meant to be a little bit didactic. Those of you who are interested in the computer foundry, all of you who are going to be interested in the computer foundry should know what that algorithm is. Oh, you can't, you're too senior. <laughs> okay, right, John, come on, give us a summary. Yeah, what, what is the significance of Bayes' formula? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the paper appeared in the mid-17th uh, mid, uh, century. But he was a vicar in Norfolk. No, he was a vicar in Tunbridge Wells, and he died. <laughs> and, and when he died, his, his wife asked Richard Price, the philosopher, and also actuary, and also mathematician, to look at Bay's papers. So he wrote a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, which is 54% Price, and the rest Bayes. And then Price wrote another article later on, sharpening the technical bounds, because all of these things were done with error bounds for practical calculation. Bayes' own error bounds weren't practical in any way, uh, but, but, but Price did a, a second paper on that. And so in that sense, the paper in which that appeared was written by Ayn Rand. OK, so... <laughs> <laughs> It, coming here is more of a learning experience than I expected. Um, why have I put an equation sign there? How many of you are keeping up with the literature and the claims about AI? What is it you find in, for example, the philosopher Andy Clark's work? The claim that the human is a Bayesian machine, that the cognitive processes function like a Bayesian engine. So what is the human in a search? So right, without... Begging the question, what's the algorithm on the right? Ah. Yes, and why is it called PageRank? No. <laughs> no, it's because Larry Page wrote it. Larry Page wrote it and he wanted it to label it for himself. It ranks not pages. What does it rank? And um, how does it calculate that? What is that? How do you calculate the influence of it? I'm tall. Does that mean I'm more influential than Matt? No. More, more influential people influence you. So you're connected. Yeah. Okay, so that's right. Essentially what he's saying, it's an incredibly simple algorithm, a concept and in practice. All it says is, if you have an infinite number of web pages, all of which are called Matt Jones, how can you know which is the one which is most likely to be the one persons are looking for? And what you do that by waiting, not how many pages or tra traffic goes from Matt Jones's to another site, but how many other sites send traffic to that Matt Jones. So if there's 20 Matt Jones, the one with the most traffic going to it is the one you triage. That's the one you put on the top. So you, inf you measure influence by measuring traffic. And you measure traffic not from, but to. That's all it does. It's incredibly simple. But why am I put that equation there? Because... One of the things that happens, and this is an endemic natural problem in any engineering science, which is the solutions can often end up being so enchanting, they beg the, beg the question. So what you often get with computer science solutions is it leads people to imagine that the thing they're working for, in this case the user, the human, must be isomorphic, to put it in correct mathematical terms, with the solution. So a Bayesian algorithm 
provides techniques for probabilistic inquiries about something is actually only the mechanical version of what the human mind does. That has all sorts of problems. One, it shows a fantastic lack of imagination. But more importantly, it involves certain sorts of premises. But it's not always wrong. Think about search, page rank. It certainly solved the problem of information retrieval, but it leads us to assume that the user is a certain type of creature. How many of you have done your research on search? Why do I use this phrase, information forager? Uh, me. <laughs> um, no, no, information forager, that was, the, that was the label for the user in the early models of search engineering. What was the searcher? Well, the searcher wasn't a curmudgeonly famous grey beard. It was a generic creature called an information forager. And what is the generic creature of an information forager they had in mind? A student. Some of you are students. Some of you might still, even now, perhaps not all of you, go to the library. And what you will find in the library is actually the model of the interface for a search engine. The search engine interface is modelled on an index to a library, for books in a library, because that was the model of the user. Now, one of the things that might, you might change about this, you might notice other things. So, for example, I've... Come on. Uh, do a bit of an What's the top bit on the right above my university? What's the top six hits there? What's special about them? Well, come on. All of you should know this. Every day you do this, millions of times, the top... For a while on search engines, the top block would be grey scored. Why was it grey scored? Because they're adverts. So they then, Google and Bing, discovered that the advertisers got a bit pissed off because people weren't clicking on the adverts. So they discreetly removed the grey scoring so that users think, oh, I'll just click on the top one. You're clicking on a paid for advert. My boss, my vice chancellor pays for Lancaster Island to be top left. That's not a response from a search, a uh, freestanding search. The freestanding search takes you to a Wikipedia entry. That's the one the page rank delivers. It doesn't deliver Lancaster University. So, of course, my boss says, oh, my God, let's pay Google 10p and buys that space. OK. So how do you innovate in that space? Well, you can reimagine the user. I mean, I'm setting this up, it should be straightforward here. Lots of ways you can reimagine the user. You can do fill work, for example. What, what, what would you do? Would you hang out with students in the library? Well, if you went to the library here and found students hanging out, would you find them doing information foraging? Well, I shouldn't think so. They'd be in the library for other reasons, trying to find a bit of peace and quiet, trying to find someone to date, someone to find on their Facebook account, trying to get away from the prospect of sitting in a lecture and struggling to keep awake. All sorts of motivations. So what do you do if you go to people like We did a study, I did a study with colleagues, and these are the sorts of things that you find. If you, if you ask what people are doing in search engines and ask them in different places, all, you find all sorts of different sorts of activities. List them up there. Let's just focus on a couple of them. The penultimate one, respite. One of the things that was interesting about respite was if you go and look in offices, any workplace, even in the University of Swansea, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, lots of admin staff, for example, people who have a day's work, who start work at nine and work till five, unlike academics who might suffer from an excessive languor before the 10th cup of coffee and do nothing before 11 o'clock, those are people who have been industrious, need a break. And what do they do? They go on a search engine. And they play. It's respite. It's just distraction. It's some other, it's some other purpose. They YouTube. They surf. And then what do people do when they come home? If you look at people coming home, if you're my age when you come home, you come home, you put the Radio 4 on, then you put the kettle on. And what are you doing when you put the kettle on and Radio 4 on? You're turning them on to turn yourself off. If you're younger, you have a bit more vitality, a bit more of a digital spirit. What do you do when you come home? What do my boys do? They turn on YouTube and search. They're just wanting to lean back and be entertained. They're not seeking anything. They want to be enchanted. 
by an algorithm. An algorithm which keeps delivering variants in my youngest boys in that version, my youngest boys, of endless variants of Led Zeppelin, which, if you're a dad, can get pretty vexing. But anyway. Well, I also, just on that particular anecdote, one of the interesting things about the YouTube algorithm, which is probabilistic, is that it ends up, if you play it long enough, once you've chosen the band like Led Zeppelin and a tune, it'll end up it's quite a wide variation. But after an hour or two, it'll keep recycling the same, the same song because that's, that, that's been optimized as the perfect solution. That anyway. <laughs> so. What I offered there was just some examples. If you do a little bit of field work, even if you do a little bit of imaginative inquiry into your own lives, you might start noticing that information foraging is only one of the things you do with search engines. It might be the thing you do most often professionally. It might be the thing that to you is the most important, but there are other things you could do. So could you alter the functionalities of search engines to do different sorts of things? Yes, you can use field work. Why do I put it there? Sometimes, in HCI, field work is a kind of ergonomics problem. People go into the field to specify what the user does, and they design a system to fit it, in a sense of what I've been talking about here. But I'm also suggesting that the bigger issue is how do you, make, how do you furnish your mind with new possibilities to think differently about what you can do with technologies like search? Well, you can do other things. You can think about metaphors and keeping it simple. So, if you were to think about, say, a search engine, what does a search engine currently do? It takes you somewhere, it takes, it takes you to a place, takes you to some information. Okay, could we just spin that differently? Could we have a search engine bring you content? Why can't it gather things? Do search engines currently gather things for you? No, they take you to a bunch of junctions where you click through, you go places. If you like, it's like a, another metaphor, it's like a train, and you jump on it to that place or to that place. Okay, but could you have another? Could you have a gathering engine? Why use that metaphor? Well, let's explore that, what that might be. If you were to take a search engine, piggyback on a search engine, plug, it, plug yourself in an application on, on the APIs, which are all pretty easy to use, you could take it, come up with this kind of, go to a site in question, scrape the content, merge and mash it together, and make stuff which you give to the user. What might that look like? Well, one of the things you might produce is this. Cards. Now, I'm going to rush ahead. How might you produce a card? Just take a search engine. Take the, take the SERPs. You all know what SERP stands for? Search Inquiry Result Page. Um, so you prioritize the factual ones. Why, what should they? The Wikipedia entries. So on the Lancaster University, you don't go to the adverts, you go to the, the, the real, real searches and the factual ones like Wikipedia. You scrape title. Do everyone know what scraping is? You just take the text, take an image, copy it. It's called scraping. Scrape title, take the first sentence, select an image. Might take two or three searches to correct some content, some images. And then you produce that little formula. So in a sense, this little application I'm showing you, and the purpose of this application is to provoke you to be more imaginative in what you think the future search might be, is to, is to use a search engine to go places, steal, make something, and bring it back to the user. And what you can bring back, you can make look glorious. That's all we've done there, is put a nice bit of design, a nice bit of graphics to render a card. Now, if you have cards, all sorts of different things happen. It seems to work, that's one thing we were worried it wouldn't work. But you can do other things. Once you have cards, you can keep them, you can put them on your desk book, your desktop. The search engine's done some work for you that's different from a normal search engine, because rather than taking you elsewhere away from your desktop, it's bringing stuff to your desktop. So it can sit in your desktop. It has, if you like, a tangibility. If it has a tangibility, you can also drag and drop it. You can put it into an email and send it to a friend. You can store them, you can reuse them. So, what am I wanting to convey here? I'm trying to illustrate ways of thinking differently about what search engines might be. And um, here, I'm kind of a metaphor of a different type of user. And the different type of user seeks different types of experiences. And that can be supported in different types of technologies. So here, it's about stuff, stuff to share, to give all those sorts of possibilities. 
Now, if that is the case, you can spin on this, you can riff on this. Once you started that, that basic idea of thinking about cards, you can have cards different sorts of things. One of the things my company then were very excited about was time cards. And here we have cards which go through, say, the Wikipedia entry from Microsoft and presents cards dated, sequenced. So you could do a history of Matt, how many injuries he has. This morning he has a time card for a broken rib. In uh, the Far East he has a time card for a broken arm. You could do a history search. And one of the ways a history search might be delivered is by c bundling up those moments in history into cards. As it happens, we thought that might be quite successful and might productize it, but for reasons I shall tell you about later we didn't. So, if you start thinking differently about what search engines might do, you might start thinking differently about the user experience. But just as you might start thinking differently about the search engine, you might also think differently about the device that lets search engines work, the browser, tabs, history, pull downs. So, here's another application. What's this? Here we said, well, if you can do a tab on a search, a card on a search, could you do a card to represent your surfing in such a fashion that you can see where people have been? And you can represent these like pebbles on a beach on the Bay of Swansea. Each of those places you've been on your web browser is rendered like this, like a pebble. And you can see graphically where you've been. And you might, for example, want to drag a pebble and give it. So there, the, the metaphor to come from it, is a journey. And if the metaphor is a journey, what kinds of things might you want to come up with? Different ways of linking those things. And these could become something like a resource. Now let's take another case. In this instance, a real case. Um, well, I say a real case. The other one was a real case. It was trying to persuade uh, Explorer to think differently about the experience they offered and to one of the problems you have in research is, is not just imagination, but working with companies, businesses that have got a solution. And browsers are a well-known solution, just like search engines. And search engines have a well-known interface. Why would they want to change? Well, similarly with an internet browser uh, like Explorer, why would they want to change? And one of the things we're trying to persuade them then, for three, four years ago, was there was about to be a change that people get so familiar with the technology, they take it for granted, they don't see the value, you might come up with new sorts of possibilities. Elsewhere, of course, some things have never quite even managed to engage, engage themselves with the digital world. Museums, for example. Museums have thousands and thousands and thousands of things in the bowels underneath which are not shown. So they've been given thousands of millions, not thousands, millions of pounds by in England, for example, and in Wales, the UK government, to digitise all their stuff. And it's just sitting there, unused, vast lists of intelligible objects. And they complain. They fail in their research projects to get the public to use these things. And you only have to look at these things and you think, well, why would the public use them? How might you use it? What might be the metaphor you'd want to use there? So let's take this example. This is from a Tyne and Weir Museum. And what does the Tyne and Weir Museum have? Pretty much like I'd imagine the museum down here would have. Lots of pictures of coal down here, foundries, lots of pictures of shipbuilding. What would be the next object in this instance that comes to mind when a user sees this? If you think about search, this was kind of the home page, where would you go next? More boats? What would, what would the search engine do? A search engine triages, prioritizes, think of page rank. What would you page rank around that? What would be the next thing? Would you just see what the next most popular thing might be. Well, part of the problem here is there is no history. There's no, there's no web connection. There's just an infinite list which has never been searched through. There's also a possibility here, which you might think, well, if somebody came and saw this picture, say, at Tout, Tyne and Weir, what would be the thing that's evoked in their mind? Could the thing that's invoked in their mind be a resource for you to design with this museum, a link? A link that then could become subject to page rank and algorithms. Would it be more boats like that? 
Would it be the sound of shipbuilding? Would it be the gloves that the riveters wore? When you go into those pictures, would it be the fantastic array of spikes, these giant stumps of wood sticking up? What is it? Could choices about those sorts of matter be a resource? If then that. So in this instance, we, this is the project, I don't need to tell you much about it there. So our solution to this problem, and this problem is to try and make some summit around. Oops. Was to say, okay, let's get some users in, whoever they might be, and then offer them tentative routes through the archive. And on the basis of going through that archive, use that as an index that might in the future be a driver for future search. So we set an image, top left image, and then we selected what seemed plausible next images, and then asked people to play with this experience and see where they went. So they just click on the top one, and then the next one we would then trace. So eventually what we produced was a set of options, things you've done, and you could highlight them, you could keep them. Let me move forward a little bit. What we're actually producing was a, a way of rendering proximity. And the hope was that through getting enough users to explore the digital images, content in the museum, you might create a map, a territory. And those maps are relationships, so that, for example, if you started off with one picture, we would prompt people to look at other pictures. And we would do this not by just mapping where they went from one picture to another thing, but doing something else, which is looking at lingering times, talking to them a little bit about what they might go, so that our index become a little bit more rich and more evocative. I'm letting you read this so I can have a pause. Um, what we hoped was that this would allow co-creation. And this was a big phase, and is a big phase, and Matt's got some projects here under co-creation. The idea being that in this instance, users would create the relationship between digital content. And on the basis of that, once you start having a few territories of maps, a few opportunities to identify links between targets, you could do lots of new interesting things. One of the things you could do is not a page rank algorithm, it's the reverse of the page rank algorithm. So for example, you could say, if you look at this picture, most people in the past, the most likely next connection is this soundscape, this video we've got of shipbuilding. Or we could offer you other opportunities, like would you like to go to a picture that we think you might be interested in, which no one's looked at before? Would you like to go to the dark web in this museum? Would you like to go to territories which have been unvisited? One of the things people do in museums is want to discover. That might be their route. Other people want to know what the most important piece of information is. They want to copy other people. These are all the sorts of things they wanted to, we imagine they wanted to do. So is the interface I just showed you clunky, rather clunky, slow, required learning a new grammar, the best interface? That's not what I'm wanting to convey now. I'm trying to convey understanding the user. What is the motivation that people have when they approach museum archives? I've not come to my end. I'm just going over a territory here. Why do people go to museums? Who are they? Why are they there? When are they there? With whom are they there? These are all things that you might think about when you're thinking of the future of search engines, for example. And when you think about these dimensions, they can lead you to different sorts of ways of exploring what the interface might look like. And when you do that, they can also encourage you to think of different metaphors when you're looking at the interface and why it might be providing this or that kind of experience. Okay, now let's go back to my uh, earlier example, uh, our cards. One of the things we've been tasked with was to try and reinvent the interface for search by our directors in research. And uh, we came up with the idea of exploring this through first convincing our company then 
that search had more shapes and forms than was rendered by the information forager metaphor. That people, for example, chilled out. That people, for example, played. That people, for example, might quite like to gather things when they go on a search engine. So we built something. We built something. As I said, we built our scraping engine. And we had all sorts of problems with our scraping engine. We would scrape from multiple sites, and sometimes they didn't necessarily come up with the right picture. So when we tested our gathering engine and our cards with users, the buggers, being the users, that is, would sometimes say, this picture of Matt, that's not the Matt Jones I was after, and that text is not the right text. They would go through the list, of the 50 cards we give them, and find errors. And they were really annoying, because that really wasn't what we were wanting to test. So we started doing other things. We prioritised Wikipedia. We didn't go across the web and just rely on the search engine triaging to deliver SERPs and then scrape from the top. We prioritised factual ones on the grounds that factual ones, someone else had done the work, the Wikipedia entry had done the work, make that better. More likely that our text scraping was correct. We also had problems with pictures mismatched. Why would that be? How are pictures indexed on the web? Just names, just names. Pictures are not, not indexed visually, although there are some visual search applications now, but actually they're mostly crap. What they end up doing is prioritizing text annotations. So, Matt, if you put my name in a first visual search, you quite often get my wife. Isn't that a weird thing? Because it, my wife and I have written quite a lot of books together, so they use that combination of text. So, we produced this little application. This, there is the moral here. I'm mean, getting a little bit vexed. There is a moral here. We built this application, and we thought it was a good idea. Now, we had a choice. We could spend a lot of time coming up with a new set of algorithms to make sure our search, our scraping, optimised the best text and the best image, so that our cards are really good. We looked at each other, and we thought, we're probably not the best dudes to do that. What we're trying to do here is create a new user experience, a new interface. Why don't we take that to Bing? And Bing have hundreds of people, thousands of engineers who optimise, who could probably come up with a swathe of better algorithms for delivering better cards. We also thought that part of the problem here would be that when we showed our search engine, our cars engine, they might be unpersuaded. In fact, let me tell you what happened. We went, spent quite a long time, several months building the application, and we went to San Francisco, to Bing headquarters, and we had a big moment. We had a 15-minute slot with the head of Bing, and this is, this is a big cheese in corporate, the corporate life like Microsoft. Bing makes billions. The head of Bing makes millions. The head of Bing doesn't give out time freely. So we had our 15-minute slot. We presented our, our search card application, and we put his name in it, and it came up with a beautiful card for him and then his deputies, and it was rather like you guys at the moment. It was absolutely total silence. We thought this was an opportunity for Bing to innovate, to show different things. At the moment when Bing was struggling to compete with Google and was perceived as just trying to emulate Google, here was an opportunity to do something completely different. Total silence. In fact, it was such an awkward silence that the technical assistant who, who kind of runs the managing director took us out. But no response. A few months later, what do you see? Does anyone know what that is other than Matt Jones? That is the card that you will find if you put a search in for Matt Jones. And it is called a card. We've patented that. I've patented that. i painted that with my team. Millions of those are produced every day by Bing, by Google, by the main search engine companies. So what do we make of it? Well, one of the things that's interesting about it is that this card suffers the same problem that our cards did. Those books on the right are not by this geezer over here, are they? Are they, Matt? I can't see. <laughs> 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 the fuller, the, what the scraper has done there is scraped some books which are by Matt, but other books by Matt Jones, but it's not the same. My point here is that... Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
OK, but my point is, um, I'm trying to enthuse you about being bold and imaginative. And we came up, I'm showing you a simple example we devised, and we engineered, and we demoed it. And we thought when we demoed it, it was a bit crap. It wasn't perfect. Search engineers would say, really nice idea, boys and girls, but really, if you're going to do search, you've got to get the right target, and you deliver the right target at the top of the search lists. You're rendering the search list as cards, so, so fine, but your cards are crap. They've not got the right content. That's why we thought there was silence. We then thought, three months later, when cars started appearing, maybe our thinking was closely in line with their thinking. Maybe part of the problem here was they were thinking, oh, those guys in research who get paid more than us to come up with the idea, well, they, that is really bad news. We're not going to talk to them about it because we've been just submitted our patents. We've just submitted the proposal to do this. So the silence was, in fact, an affirmation of what we were doing. Who knows? Does it matter? What we learned from that, and what I learned from that, and what I think you should learn from that, is that it doesn't matter if your ideas get onto the desktop, right? OK, I can look at pictures of cards every day and think, oh, that's mine. Well, actually, it, it wasn't mine. Some other folks in Bing were doing it. They were, and I assume other folks were doing it, typing an idea, but that's not what you're doing research for. You don't do research because you want your name there. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing research because you think the research is good. It's about contributing, not having the final word. It doesn't matter. You should be doing research in good faith. But the problem is not just that you need to have good faith. The problem is to do things which you're excited by that make you see things differently. And one of the problems for the computer foundry and for anyone doing computer science is that most of the things they see on their machines, on their desktops, on their smartphones, were designed years ago. So they look at that and they think, OK, what do I do? One of the things you might do, for example, Matt and I were talking about this morning, was reimagining how you might deliver the same interface with, for example, tangible or corporeal inputs and outputs. I'm suggesting that, sure, you can do that, but you might imagine to do, doing different things altogether. So, for example, in the case of search engines, if search engines are devices to take you mentally to another place, to let you forage for information when you know what the information is you're looking for but cannot find it, like a pig searching for a truffle, and if that might apply for lots of the work you do and you are very happy with the interface, Nevertheless, the engine that delivers that can be an engine for doing many other very different things. And to find out what those different things is, is a trick of method, for example, field work method, but above all, it's a trick of imagination. It's the trick of allowing yourself just to play with, for example, simple different metaphors. And on the basis of simple different metaphors, come back to the beginning, and the beginning is not that the computer science engineering solution to a problem defines what the user is. But rather, you reimagine who the user might be and then come up with different computer science solutions. So for me, the computer science, the future of computer science, despite the fact that many people here are professors, famous professors of computer science, the exciting thing from my perspective on the future of computer science is changing the user re-understanding the user, and then taking what that user does to create new problems for computer science, to reimagine to what the future might be by taking the thing that's subject to the foundry is not the code. It's the creature that uses the code. And that's it. Thank you. Did they have all the same features that you had in mind when you were thinking of them as a much more flexible, user-oriented? Uh, no. The only ones they had, um, we showed that version of the map with the, the code, yes. which you highlighted, but we, we, if you like, pontified it. We got a designer to make it look like a car, yeah. like a, and to make it startling, to catch the eye. And it's still drag and drop, but... Uh, yes. And what file format are they when they drop on the website? Oh, God, that's a long time ago. We, I, think, I think we constituted them as 
PDS with, with, with links in them. So you can click on the link. Yeah, I think that's what we did. Um, but that's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, um, so there's a little bit of uh, calculation of, of re-rendering. So we had a separate engine that, that constituted them as en entities. Whereas on, when you go on a search engine now and you see the card, when you move away from that page, the card's lost. It's not stored anywhere. It's, never, it's not even kept in the indexes. So uh, the, the card from Matt doesn't get better. It's reconstituted every time it's done. Um, and there's no feedback um, mechanism, as we understand it, from clicking through the pages <coughs> on the card. This idea of looking, for example, at the museum is very interesting because the um, museum in the small does have a, usually a band of very, very interested parties because they might have special collections or, or, or might be a regional centre. And um, so the tools that would allow people to access more and more and create their own narratives around objects. Um, or even in school, for example, schools with a local history project or something. How, how, how advanced is that? Uh, let me praise you that. What, what you just summarised as a question was the essence of the proposal, which was if you, if you allow people to, to voyage through a digital archive or a museum, their voyage could come and become a resource for creating an index, for creating a model of trajectories, which could allow you to map possibilities, which could then become a resource for encouraging further similar paths, encouraging people to go to dissimilar paths. The premise was that you could get users to do sufficient number of these voyages to build up a store. And one of the problems you have with museums is that users come to the web page, come to the website, and even though you might teach them how to use it and make it incredibly easy in theory to use, Motivation is a problem because they are a little bit awestruck by the enormity of it and they feel as if when you interviewed them that they felt as if they had no rights to go through the index or the database. They were waiting for a curator to show them what was there. So the paradox here was the curators were saying, we haven't curated that stuff because we don't know how to curate it. Why doesn't the user come along, go through it, start lingering, go from one thing to another and on that basis we can learn how to curate and make that curation manifest in a search experience, in an interactive search experience, but the users weren't willing to do that. And they said, no, no, you need to create it for us. So we found ourselves in this kind of paradox. Now, um, one way forward was to create a rough and ready index, a search association, which we did in the first place. But you could extend that. And obviously the Bayesians, for example, say, oh, what well, if you take this image? Let's use some Bayesian techniques to associate it with this other content over there. And you come up with a, a range of probabilities, much the same way that you might say that Bayes was interesting in finding that black ball on the snooker table, if you come if it was a snooker table. Likewise, we might come up with the techniques of leading people to the right ball. That was a possibility, but we, we didn't pursue it. The problem there is the motivation that people have when they go to museums, because one of the things that came out of that, to summarise here, is that people go to museums to be in awe. And to be in awe means you stand still. You're like a rabbit waiting in the headlamps. And it's the curator presents it to you. And you're awestruck by the wonder of the things presented to you. You don't feel as if you have the moral right to have be an agent. And this was trying to shift that possibility. Is that an answer for you? Yeah, very, very important and exciting thing, at least in the museum sector, to keep working on so I think there are various museums like Birmingham, for example, have a, a, a tradition of very enthusiastic <coughs> creative traditions. And, and, and even, even the, I think, um, the Wallace Collection, which is in a not particularly sort of part of London, has yes. had a number of primary schools uh, curate and talk about what they've got, but then it's possible. So, but digitally, I think it's very important especially because um, these museums are, are huge treasure resources. Uh, they, they themselves are not able to cope with their own staff. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, the Wallace Collection, those of you haven't, is actually Mayfair, which is this rather nice part of, of the West End. Um, um, it's just off Park Lane. Um, and it is a fabulous collection. And what makes it fabulous is irrelevant, but it's just it's an opportunity to sell this. It has the most extraordinary ecl eclectic bunch of stuff from the most fantastically Game of Thrones armour through to the most puffy-faced 18th century aristocrats in 
and, and décolletage shown full wear in the, in the boudoirs. It's fabulous. But how you might you index that is precisely one of the problems. They had a lot of primary schools make some exhibitions there some years ago. Uh, and it was quite an interesting exercise. Getting the primary schools to make some exercise. Children can't easily relate to that, that sophistication of uh, applied art. Yeah. Um, no, just let me rip a little bit. One of the things that some of you probably won't, won't know this, but um, Tim Berners-Lee is very contrary, and he makes Harold look charming. Um, and um, um, one of the reasons why he's very contrary is because he thinks that when he invented with some others the idea of uh, web browsing, HTML and so forth, what it would allow would be one person to go into another person's desktop. All their files would be available. It would be a way of having massive shared information and access to everyone's knowledge. What he complains about is that all the web is that content that's been taken away and repurposed and tagged up and marked up in this new format to be accessible. So the web for him is a diminished repository. And the great opportunity, much like the Wallace collection, remains elsewhere. But one of the things that is derives from selecting content on the web is that the things you find on the web are being optimised for the experience of the web. So there's a sort of paradox here. If you put everything on the web, people probably wouldn't have found the enchantment they find on the web to find the right sort of things quickly, optimised with one-page indexes, what the kinds of browsing experience is that people have. But for the future, one of the things we need to imagine, and one of the ways is to try and think how you can teach people, provide people opportunities to do different things on the web, so that they start getting dissatisfied in the way that Tim Berners-Lee is about what you find on the web. And there's a paradox here. It's a deep and profound paradox, here, which is the content on the web has been optimised for the tools designed to interact with that web. And those tools in that context dictate the kind of person who uses the web. It detects you, the kind of knowledge you, you have. Think of it in terms of social media experiences. A quality of social media experiences is, is complained to be its ephemerality, its brevity, its tempo, just this, just this, just this. And that's bound up with this, the size of the device used to deliver it to you. It's small, hand size, teeny weeny bits of interaction. So other people say you need methods of communication which allow a bigger canopy. And likewise here, one of the things you might say about search engines is that they also constrain. But for the computer foundry, this is such an opportunity for reimagining many different things to make the Wallace collection an exemplar of reimagining what the HTML and the web might be, so that people like Tim Berners-Lee can growl less vociferously in their office. You can ask a question. First of all, I agree with this, you know, that agenda of the competition foundry where we're charged with uh, imagination which will take ourselves from an intellectual point of view and then end users to new destinations is exactly what we should do rather than jumping on the autonomous bandwagons of the future and just trying to catch up with perhaps uh, other groups and companies that have been doing uh, the same thing for a long time. So thank you very much for that call to arms. And I want to reflect on two technologies that I uh, have. Um, so one is a set of speech-based technologies. And two things in my house that respond to speech. My dog and Alexa. So one of those two, when I speak to it, provides me with warmth and empathy and uh, a sense of being. The other makes me feel like I am a machine and that I have to learn a new way of expression which fits in to some form of structure which is other than myself. I'll ask you which one you think is the dog. The other is, I just bought a, a new car, um, and this car has various moments where it will drive itself. It has this magical moment that it will find the parking space, and it will find me into the slot, and I take my hands from the wheel, and it whizzes around in Harry Potter-esque Style. Although that's sort of, um, you know, uh, from the arty point of view, quite lovely, it's a very different experience for me occasionally putting my hands fully on the wheel and putting my foot down on the accelerator and then feeling that rush of adrenaline 
as I, in a modern style, pause, so I'm driving off into the sunset. So those two technologies, speed technologies and autonomous cars, are seen as the future. The industrial strategy in the UK was published this week, and artificial intelligence and autonomous uh, devices, driving car, driverless cars, are seen as vital for post Brexit Britain. Just wondered if you want to reflect. For us as a competition foundry, what should we be in your answer to the question? Dogs or Alexa? A sense of freedom, driving and being in control, or driverless autonomous vehicles? Uh, well, these are questions of the moment. And one of the things I said at the beginning of my talk was I could provide you two examples of an algorithm with an equation. And the equation was to a person. And one of the things we're finding with Alexa is that the speech engine engineers who are so impressed with the 92% rates they get through their the combination of Bayesian techniques and large data sets that they think they've solved the problem of human machine interaction because speech or sound is involved. They haven't asked because they have redefined the user by thinking of a speech and speech solution. They think of the, of the, of the user in terms of what the speech engine does. All the user is a speech engine. So if you have the two speech engines communicating to each other, surely that's satisfactory. Well, they haven't asked a different question, which is why is it one person might talk to another person? When one person talks to another person, is it because two persons are, are speech systems? And what are they doing with speech system? A speech system is an instruction method. Here's an instruction, here's go and do this. My best friend, Phil, phones me most two or three days a week and my instruction is not an instruction. My instruction is, shut up, Richard, just let me tell you about the day. He offloads and complains about his wife, his work, the meetings, blah, 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 his car breaks down, and he fills my answer machine up. He's the only person I know who can fill my answer machine up. I didn't know there was a limit in my answer machine. He's give, not giving me an instruction. What is my task? My task is to listen, because I'm his best mate. And then at the end, I change the subject. The point about this is that the two users have a, are not sharing commands and instructions. Alexa has un, is under the notion that what, what, what a voice-based machine in the home might do is obey, is command. But in the home, do you go home and expect that your others will obey and command? Do you obey and command? Is going home sometimes about listening? Is sometimes going home about ignoring? Is sometimes going home about... The song, I love my boys listening to my boys talk, and then we banter. And my wife gets very upset when we banter because sometimes it gets a bit edgy. But it's essentially content-free. It's about manufacturing giggles. The problem with the engineers who built Alexa is they, don't, they haven't bothered to inquire or to open up their imagination as to what people are doing with words. And one of the, th one of the things you might say about doing with words is that there's many things that are being done with words, least of all sharing instructions. And one of the things you're doing with words is doing it collaboratively. You're doing it together. So Alexa struggles when there's more than one person talking to it at the same time. But quite a few of you are young. But those of you who are older know that family life is never about soliloquies. A soliloquy is what an actor does. I'm soliloquizing now. Family life is a chaos of interruptions and words. And mums getting cross and dad's getting surly because they feel that they've never been listened to, and teenagers complaining there's not enough food in the fridge, even as they're being talked to about doing homework. It's a, it's a symphony of different things. Okay, where would, you, where would you find tools to support that? Well, one of the, lots of ways of thinking different things about what home life is about. Home life isn't necessarily about efficiency and instruction. Home life is about wonder, joy, playfulness, indifference, casualness, the capacity for silence and the capacity for noise. Once you open up those possibilities, new metaphors might be to devise for what you can do with a speech engine. And instead of the speech engine defining what the, human, the user is, the speech engine can be a tool reimagined by redefining the types of things users do at home. That's one of the things I, th I think you should be saying about Alexa. The subject of intelligent cars and is another set of issues. One has to do with a sense of autonomy, sense of purpose. Another has to do with um, the desire to experience, the desire to feel 
what it is to, to, to drive. Another is the desire to feel as if one is in control of oneself. Matt's complaint about the, the magical wheel turning is possibly um, a little bit perplexing, because after all, too many take trains, I mean, you don't have a problem with train driver driving for you, so the fact that other machines can do work, can travel for you, isn't necessarily in, an intrinsic issue. The issue here is something about his choice of this car park space, his choice of car, his choice to choose now to park now, needs to be manifest in, I'm going to do the parking, because I'm a father, that's my car, that's my car park space, I want to own that experience. Okay. Well, why not use that as the premise for designing applications around it, rather than fighting the diverse character of human nature by imposing on human nature what the, what the technologies can do? Start the other way. And the technologies are fantastic, but too often get rammed into places which people find irksome. And that's, you know, part, part of the problem with computer science isn't that computer science isn't incredibly innovative. It's just that fitting the innovation into the wonderful opportunities out there is often badly done. And we're going through this period now with AI, where in a year or two, the spirit of AI will have and will turn to what's, what has been called um, an ice age. Because people will think this is not being, doing the things it said it would do, and in any case, is vexing me, is annoying me. And you know, one, one, one of the things, let me finish, one of the things that comes with Bayesian techniques for speech engines is that you will get 90, 92% correction, correct interpretations by any measure of the test, but the remaining 8% are fantastically weird. It's a function of how the algorithm works. You're gonna get really weird answers. Not answers which seem slightly wrong, but like, how the hell did Alexa think that? Now, for a while, that's fun. For a while, it creates a bit of laughter. Look at kids playing with Siri and Alexa. What are they trying to do? They're trying to provoke those really funny, totally spurious, totally left-field answers. How long is that going to last? There is fun in mockery. There is fun in the mischief of it. But there's also a lesson here, which is maybe this, the, the speech engine engineers are missing the point about what they're trying to deliver here. If they confine themselves to um, tasks which are massively dull and massively easy to predict, rather than this optimistic hope of being able to answer any question and resulting in this weird kind of oddnesses coming out, the future of AI might be a bit more positive. But as, at, at the moment, we're going through this period of perplexed enchantment. And I hope I've perplexed you and enchanted you a little bit, and I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much.